We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining our session today. My name is Catherine Moya, and I will be one of the speakers today. And I'm joined by my co-speaker. Um, her name is Esther. So I can see that we have people both um, online and offline. So I'll just give a wave to the people who are joining us from, from Poland. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll ask Esther to introduce herself as well. Hi, Kate. It's, it's so exciting to be part of the IGF and, and to just co-host this with you here in Zambia and you're all the way there in Kenya and we have people in Poland. Hi. It, it, it's really just a big sign of how the internet can connect us all. So I'll introduce myself. I'm Esther and I'm the founder of Digital Grassroots. I'm also an open internet leader. And I'm very excited to be co-hosting this lightning talk um, with you, Kate. Back to you. Okay. Um, so I will introduce myself. Uh, my name is Catherine Moya. I work um, currently as the program officer for digital in Article 19 Eastern Africa. Um, I'm mostly concerned with um, freedom of expression and access to information um, and issues to do with digital inclusion and privacy within the Eastern African region where we work. Um, before that, I also served as an open internet leader where I met Esther. Um, and this is just a program that empowers people from different um, different jurisdictions around the world. So Africa and some of our colleagues from Southern, um, so SEE region, I think, um, just to, to engage in internet leadership. Yes, internet leadership. So um, I want to speak more about what prompted me to, to do this or to rather undertake this project and, and, and whatever we're going to be discussing. So during my time as an open internet leader, I focused a lot on my in-country research was um, the legal framework that regulates online violence. And I think I want us to begin and why I thought this was important. And it was because at the time I looked at um, what was going on around that time, because when we were making the applications, it was around COVID. And what happened was the issues of online violence had been identified before, right? But the impact was not was not being felt. So what we have in Kenya is a culture of people who already, because of our culture, are really misogynistic and antagonistic even online. And they do spread hate speech and rhetoric speech online. And it's sometimes a lot demeaning on women. So what happens, I'd give an example for, for, for some time now. Um, so we have the in-country context is that um, regardless of what happens, it's always blamed on women somehow. Um, so whether, for example, it's femicide. So I'll give an example of um, one of our students, she's a medical student and her name was Ivy, and she was unfortunately a victim of femicide. So one of her ex-boyfriends came to her school and, and actually just asked her. It's, I'm sorry, there's really no nice way of, of putting that. So um, what happened is that online you had all these memes about access and all these memes about how Nairobi girls are are easy and they're, they're contributing to their own demise and stuff like that. So um, over the COVID period, the first COVID patient in Kenya was also a victim of online harassment. When she came out to speak about COVID, people started bullying her. And then they started um, looking through her social media posts and then they attacked her, they attacked her family, they released her nudes from God knows where. Um, so that was sort of the environment that was going on at the time. And that prompted me to check on how the law, the Kenyan law that we have, was addressing was addressing online violence. Mainly because when we talk about issues of inclusivity, we want more people to come online. But the experiences of women online already were pushing those who are not there or who are not connected to what to not want to connect at all. 
So this is a premise where I was coming from. Um, I checked a lot on what were the most prevalent forms of online violence that we had in Kenya. Um, a lot of studies had been done. So what I did was just to consolidate that research. And a lot of this had to do with issues of hacking, insults, um, unwarranted access and sharing of personal images. And then after that, I looked at so what laws do we have in Kenya and how are they regulating online violence? So when it came to issues of children, there was a lot of reform that was needed within our Kenyan law that the, the government is currently trying to do, but is really slowed down. Because again, we're almost going towards an election season in Kenya in next year. And so that is that process is always slowed down because you have to come up with new parliamentarians who then have to accept the law from parliament, which delays the whole process. And then another thing is the laws that we already have in terms of cybercrime laws were being used to stifle freedom of expression and harass journalists, as opposed to actually being implemented for online violence. And then the last and final thing was that this was not, a lot of efforts were going on from civil society and from government as well, but they were not really known, even to the people who were victims. So a lot of people, even just journalists that I talked to, and the people from radio, they really had been victims, but they didn't really know um, what they were supposed to do after that. So there was a lot of lack of awareness. And so at this point, um, to avoid being a monitor, I will invite Esther to also give her experience. Well, hey, I, see, I feel like we, we need to deep dive into that after I go a bit into where I'm coming from, because just hearing the stories that you're sharing, it almost seems like the misogyny and patriarchal practices that are embedded in our culture, in our society, are showing up online. And it's almost seen real life situations like the tragic murder that you just mentioned is is turned into a meme, it's turned into a joke, a joke. And what does that mean for for victims of gender based violence? How does that affect how we as women can report cases that are affecting us? Because if if we go online and we're turned into a meme, what doesn't that just amplify the harm? And I think that's something we can we can talk a bit about. And after that, I would also would we would also invite uh, everyone attending to also contribute their perspective. So just putting that preamble there, and also sharing from from my personal perspective uh, of digital grassroots. So we are a youth and female led organization, and we're working to increase digital citizenship in local communities. And we do so uh, by trying to equip or view the capacity of youth to engage in internet governance. And we are always doing this with a mind, a mindfulness on including gender diverse persons and women in, in our program. This way we can have women representing their own community. And I will also add that there, there is a push for bridging the gender digital divide. There is a big push to bridge just the, the digital divide from the north-south aspect and also from the urban and rural aspect. So the, the main purpose of this session is to ask the question, as we are bringing more people online, are we bringing women online to be harassed? Are we bringing women online in spaces where they can be safe or in spaces where the abuse they're facing would be amplified? And um, Digital Grassroots right now is uh, an action coalition leader in the generation equality for technology and innovation for gender equality. And one key question we're asking, how can we innovate and use technology that is feminist and responsive to the needs of girls, women, and gender diverse people all over the world from different cultures? And this is something that I, I believe should be central to the conversation on 
connectivity. We want to bridge the gender digital divide, but when people join, uh, become connected online, when they start engaging on social media, are they more likely to face harm or are we creating a space where women's rights can be upheld? And I think this is a conversation that needs to be taken more seriously, uh, especially for us who are advocating for connectivity. Because from what we're seeing, we're seeing a woman goes online and she's silenced and goes offline. And there's a lot of um, entitlement to, to women online, if I can say, to sharing a woman's images without consent, to, to shaming women simply because uh, someone posted a picture. And I feel like that also affects the that also affects the quality of connectivity. We need to have meaningful connectivity, not just connectivity, but meaningful connectivity. And centering women actually allows us to tackle this from an intersectional point of view, because we're not just looking at it from the patriarchal lens. And we have to also recognize that many of the big texts that are allowing us to engage online are also very male dominant. Silicon Valley is very male dominant. And how does that influence the products that they're pushing to us? So that is like a key issue that we have been working on. And at Digital Grassroots, we see that a solution comes in when we are equipping community members with the solution. So instead of a top-down approach where we dictate what communities need, we use a bottom-up approach to, to sort of just say, this is what the community needs and responding to the community needs in that way. And this is actually in line with the original values of an open and free internet, uh, of a decentralized internet. Because the more we embody the needs of the communities that we're serving, the more the internet will be a healthy place where people can connect and build connections without harm, especially for women, girls, and gender diverse people. And uh, I'll just conclude with what Digital Grassroots has been doing specifically in that lens. And each year, Digital Grassroots has an ambassador's program. And in this program, we have four weeks of training on internet issues, such as internet for security, internet for economy, and internet for social life. And we have four weeks of mentorship. So we, we match our mentors with industry experts who then equip these young people who are all below 29 with the tools to understand how to participate meaningfully in internet governance and connect their communities. We also have a community leaders program where we connect with other organizations. We have worked We've collaborated with the Open Internet for Democracy Initiative, which we're a part of. Uh, we've also collaborated before with Mozilla on the Internet Health Report. And this has allowed us to amplify the voices of people on the ground. And we always have an equitable view of it, where we are make sure that our program caters at least to 50% or more women, which has allowed us to be able to have a feminist approach to, to this issue. There's still a lot to be done, and I wouldn't say civil society is the only answer. Every stakeholder has a role to play. So that's, uh, that's it for me. Um, Esther, I think you you raise amazing points, and I think maybe before we accept questions or or any um, feedback from our participants, I just want to ask. Um, you mentioned a lot on the work that you do and the bottom up approach that you that mm -hmm. you do. I think taking your perspective as a developer, like I, I don't anticipate that this is something that people are thinking about, right? Like mm -hmm. if you're a developer, you're not really thinking about online violence and or, yeah. or something of the sort. But then how do we then make so is there a need for us to broaden the 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 the, the 
the uh, the recipients of the messages that we're giving out. Mm. So um, the people who need to like, because if you're a developer, you're thinking about the best user experience, not really yeah. thinking about safety or or anything like this. So I think maybe I just want to pick about your brain on what what you think could be done to improve certain aspects or to Im- to increase the number of stakeholders that we get from the development community inside this discussion. Mm-hmm. Or what's their role inside this discussion? Thank you, Kate, for that. And and before I answer that, I think I would also like to hear from you on a human rights-centered approach based on the case study that you shared, which is not a case study, it's a real-life story, a very sad story, and what could have been done, what could be done differently. But in terms of who needs to be in this conversation, I feel like we need to recognize that the social sciences cannot be separate from the more technical aspects of the internet. Because at the end of the day, the internet is a communication medium. It allows us to connect, it allows us to express ourselves. And so what we see happening is that there is a technical aspect that has been covered, but the social science part of it has not really been implemented for many reasons, but one of the core reasons is profitability. The more people use, for example, an app, the more profitable it is. And so when we see that Globally, I think this is even going into the broader concept of the world we live in. Globally, women have less economic power as it is. There is a lot of gender inequality in terms of economy, which means that who is buying at this point? It is either men or products that serve this group. And because they're also the ones who created it due to the gender inequality, that is happening globally. So there is a need for a a conversation on understanding the social science behind it and also seeing, speaking more on a feminist lens. And this can be done. I believe that this should be an aspect of each and every technical person's study or journey because we're not, it's sort of like building a house, but you're not taking into consideration the people who are going to live in it. And so it's not just about building a product that works or that doesn't have many bugs. It's about building for people in a way that um, acknowledges or at least creates a space where our human dignity can be amplified rather than harm being amplified which also goes back to how do these, uh, how do people profit online and how can we change where harm is more profitable than good? So that's, that's an answer I can give off the top of my head. And I would also invite anyone who has a comment, I think, to, to give it in the chat or, or to raise their hands in the room. Okay, over to you. With my okay. So I think I'll, I I think those are really insightful insights, but I, I want to answer your question on what I think could have been done differently, right? Um, so imagine at the height of the pandemic, right? People don't believe number one that because it was in around March, May, people don't believe number one that the pandemic is real. So we are all struggling to believe that COVID nineteen is actually. Mm-hmm. And then you are the first patient. So what happened is she came from studies abroad. So she came and she was a first patient and she was admitted and she's now recovered. And then you want people to believe that um, coronavirus is real so that they can wash their hands and, and do everything. And then you appear on national TV, right? So you appear on national TV and you are giving your story. The aim of you coming out, knowing that you would face that much stigma is so that People can see you as a real person. People can see you as someone who has gone through the whole pandemic and has recovered and now take measures seriously. But that's not what happened. Um, What happened is the the victim was trolled. People said she was lying. People said she was a puppet for the government. 
they went and looked through her Facebook post, everything she had ever posted on Facebook. Um, they brought it to Twitter, and then they called themselves the directors of investigation on Twitter, and they said um, they are unraveling what is now the truth about her. They got information wow. about her boyfriend. They got information about her nudes. They made fun of her. They shared them everywhere on WhatsApp, on Telegram. Um, then what happened is that it became an issue of national concern. So the Minister of Public Health, he came out to speak about it. Um, some journalists also, they came out to speak about it. But what people did is then they turned on anyone who came out to support her. So they came out and attacked the minister online as well. They wow. came out and attacked the journalist. And the, 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 the bad thing about it was that the journalist was also female. So they started wow. asking questions about the journalist and her husband, the wow. fact that we can't trace the source of her wealth, and they removed pictures. So it was the same thing for everyone. Wow. What I think would have been done differently. First, um, all those things are still online. All those trending hashtags that were there at the time were still online. Um, because anyone else who came out to support to support the victim was also falling victim. I think that in that sense, it really made it difficult to, to support her or it really made it difficult for you to come out and stand for the mm -hmm. truth. So even if you saw a, a post or a tweet that was abusive, you couldn't really do anything about it because you felt like if you did, then they would turn on you next. Or mm -hmm. if you spoke out against it, then they would turn on you next which is why I think it's an important aspect of connectivity because what we're talking about when we talk about meaningful connectivity is that people should have devices, speed, but then they should also have regular access to the internet. But what you have is people who are icons, people who are people who people look up to. So like a, a well-respected journalist or a minister being trolled online for doing the right thing. Wow. And then you start asking yourself if you want to do the right thing also, mm -hmm. or if it just costs less for you to not do it. The worst mm -hmm. thing about this is that because it was trending, the Twitter algorithm made it so much popular for like a whole week, right? So it trended, the whole conversation trended for a whole week and I think the entire weekend. So I think one of the things we need to do is we need to be able to, number one, um, be able to, to first have this community of people who are able to report posts, but that only happens if people are aware that they can do that, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think the second thing is how do we build confidence on making people, because you see, if you're saying that we're taking a bottom-up approach, then yeah. it's easier for the internet users themselves to just report the posts. Or it's easier for them to report it or post something that they think is supportive or just be an active online bystander. But yeah. if they can't do that or if the platform itself is inaccessible, if the algorithms itself are promoting content that's insensitive, then how do we, how can we be able to, to, to change that? I think one of the things that I think could have been done differently is number one, if we had access to their platforms and you'd obviously be able to tell them that, listen, this is the trending hashtag, mm -hmm. yes, but it's not really trending in the most correct way. It's inhumane because mm -hmm. it happens every time, even when we were making memes of the unfortunate medicine, medical student. Right? So I think um, number one, access to platforms is something that we don't have or we don't have the luxury of having. And then two, um, emboldening people is something that we're not doing enough. And mm. so we don't all feel safe and we don't all feel like we can be able to participate to create a safer online community. Um, yeah. I think I think those are my comments for, for your question. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kate. And I guess I, I think those are really great pointers, I just say. Firstly, the platforms that we use have to be accessible it doesn't have to be difficult for the user to connect with, with the platform. And the second step is making sure that we, we try to, to evaluate how the algorithms work and what they promote and how to respond to that. And I think it's also very important to see what does regulation mean and are there any consequences for the platforms that cause harm? Because I feel like at this point in the current scenario that we're living in, there isn't really any real consequences. 
for the platforms that we use and for the harms that they cause. And so that it remains on us to feel, to think about how to protect uh, victims of abuse. And I feel like that's an insufficient way of addressing the issue. Uh, at the same time, I also want to hear from, from the room or from, from the chat on your thoughts about what we have been discussing in this lightning talk. So please, please feel free. Feel free to raise your hand or to unmute. I'm not sure how the participants in the in at Poland are able to to maybe um, give us their thoughts. Um, I don't know if they can unmute or speak, or they could also just um, tag us. Oh yeah, so they have a comment. <laughs> this is so exciting to see. Uh, okay, Hi, nice to meet you. Um, you talk about um, what actions we can do as a internet users in Twitter or in Facebook or another social apps. Uh, um, well, I, I'd like to, uh, to ask you how to be a good active bystander in, in, in the internet. What we can do, for example, when we see uh, hashtags that uh, are promoting, hashtags which do not um, promote things that are sensible, as you say, uh, what, what what can we do? Because should we just report them or ignore them, or we, should we just um, make an an actual action against them? So just write a comment that's against some uh, v v some some um, insensible content co content. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if we have another question because we have so we just have a few minutes left and then we can answer both of them. But um, we have one from Frank. Maybe we could take that and then just answer before our time runs out. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, uh, maybe one thing I would want to know. I, I would want to inquire from you, uh, uh, Catherine. How do you deal with the levels of digital literacy uh, with the grassroots people that you work with? I'll share an example. We work with refugees, but you find they cannot even understand the, uh, information like um, online sexual harassment, uh, things that happen online because of the knowledge on digital rights and digital uh, high levels of digital literacy. Maybe you could share your perspectives on that. Thank you. Okay. Um, so because of time, I think we just have to answer those two questions. So um, I'll take the first one and then Esther, you can jump on. So for how to be an active bystander, right? So when you're an active bystander, you either like a supportive comment or you report the, the comment to the platform or you report the tweet to the platform or um, you then are able to create a safe community. But I think what the one thing that you need to, co to, to remember as an active bystander is that you also need to be safe, right? So you always do the things that you think are most comfortable for you. So whether that's um, if somebody has already retweeting a, something that's supportive, basically just using the tools that you have at your disposal to, to promote active messages. So yes, you can do something as an active bystander, but then you also have to be very conscious about your safety. And then final thing about um, reaching the, the online communities, my example has been that demonstrations work and also language works. So how you design your campaign is really important. So issues of language. So if you're coming um, to talk to maybe people who don't, that they understand digital literacy, just not in the way that probably you think that they do or probably the way you're presenting it. However, if it's changed or however, if you design your campaign, to more or less have a lot of visuals come down to maybe using different languages or maybe this has been my example. When I show maybe a demonstration of what things are, give people examples they can relate with, um, that makes people feel very connected and then they get to understand digital rights from that perspective. As <laughs> Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you so much for the questions from Poland and also from uh, our our participant, Frank. 
And I will say that internet at the bottom line is a personal issue. And many times we see that the discussions online have become politicized. People are using it as a political battle. So even as a good bystander, you also have your own politics. And so even when you comment, someone can turn it into a political view, even if it's just a human rights view. And that's something we need to start to be aware of. And Frank, you also mentioned working with refugees and also working with people who are not connected. They also have a political view and a political voice. It could be a human rights view, but when they join online, it's seen as a political perspective. So I believe the first thing should be safety by design, security by design. So if it means being aware of how to protect your identity online, how to use good and strong passwords, how to use two-factor authentication, okay. then that is a good point to start. Okay, um, I think we have to wrap up because we're at like 4.15 exactly. So I'm going to thank you all for your participants at Poland for the participants we had online for joining us for this session. And we hope to work together in future. Bye guys, thank you so much to the organizers. <laughs> Hi, Anna. Right I ask. could just see you have a comment. Please just feel free to reach out to us on Twitter and we can answer your comments from there or on the platform on IGF. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>